Hello, and welcome to Weed and Grub. Were you offended? Because to me, that's a huge compliment. <laughs> I, I wasn't offended. I just like felt the need to comment on her comment saying that I did indeed roll that joint myself. You did I was roll proud it. of it. Yeah. Because I'm not good at rolling joints, and I like pulled one off. <laughs> May I disagree? I have to disagree with you. You're so good at rolling joints that somebody said, okay, I guess use a cone to roll a joint. Yeah. Because you rolled it so well that they thought that you were filling a cone. So congrats, Mary Jane. Thank you, Mike. I was excited about that. That was uh, like, it was a fun Instagram reel to make. And I don't know, I was just so proud that I like pulled it off in real time for the reel. And because I like I have been historically terrible at rolling joints. Like I learned a long time ago and it's like I can make a functional fatty, but they're all like lumpy and weird and then, you know, they always canoe and stuff. And this one I was like, oh my God, I'm like actually getting better. To me, rolling a joint is sometimes like parallel parking in that like if people are watching me parallel park and they're strangers, ooh, yeah. I'm going to bump both cars and reset my life every single time. Oh, I don't want anyone to watch me. In fact, I think I told you to look away while I was rolling it. I was like, look away, look away. Yeah. I can't do it in front of people. No, no, no. In no. case of the yips. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you nailed that one. And Thanks. What up, Mary Jane? How's it going, Mike? It's going tremendous. Welcome to Weed and Grub, everybody. This is a podcast about comedy. Cannabis. Culture. Cooking. Calling shit out. And, and uh, books. Books. Ooh, yes. love a good book. It's all about books this this week because Love of our amazing guests. Yeah, yeah, Roxanne Gay. Truly tremendous. So excited. Right. It was really wonderful to just, yeah, I'm so excited. Well, before we get to Roxanne Gay, we have a couple of things we have to do. Yes. On the joint rolling tip. Yes. You can always get better. You can always get better. That's the thing. It's it's a, It really is about the 10,000 hours. Like, even if you're not naturally gifted, you can learn to roll the joint, just like you can learn to parallel park. It might feel like you'll never learn, and especially if people are watching you, you're definitely never going to get better at it. But, like, practice on your own at home. And, you know, practice with, like... Like, don't use your, you know, good weed if you don't want to, like, grind up all of your, like, kind bud and you, you want to save that for your bong. But, like, practice with whatever. You can practice with fucking oregano if you want to. Mm -hmm. Although it is easier, I will say, to roll a joint with really dank weed because it sticks together. Oh, great And that great way where, tip. like, it holds its own shape, right? So yeah. I did learn that when I started rolling up with good weed. I was like, oh, it's so much easier because <laughs> it sticks to itself. That's awesome. Yeah. You know what's a good rolling paper to roll with? OCB. How'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> because they present our news segment, which is up next. The Grubly Gazette is presented by OCB Rolling Papers, the largest rolling paper brand in the world, crafted naturally since 1918. OCB offers a full line of plant-to-puff papers. I like that so much. Made with sustainable fibers farmed from within a 500-kilometer radius of their facility in France, which is powered by 100% green energy. Ooh, treating the earth right. In 2020, OCB rolled out America's first ultra-thin, slow-burning, bamboo rolling papers and cones made from 100% French milled bamboo. Mm. They're even burning, no tear, GMO free and vegan. I love that they're vegan. That's so... It's great. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. I want to put in my body and lungs things that belong there. Not all rolling papers are created equal. Are your current papers going all in with their paper making process to deliver sustainable harmony on high like OCB or are they selling you hot smoke? Ask for OCB wherever you buy your rolling papers and sample the entire line of products. Plus, visit OCBUSA.com and follow OCB on Instagram at OCB underscore USA. Nice. They're great. Yeah. And if you like us and our podcast, please check out OCB and support the people who support us. 100%. Thanks, OCB. Thank you. What's our news? So interesting. So this is from MarijuanaMoment.net, where we get quite a bit of our news from. Great site. So I chose today's news story because I thought it was interesting because it's partially funded by the federal government. Wow. This is from the National Bureau of Economic Research, who is saying that states that have legal cannabis are seeing a decline in workers' compensation claims. Hmm. They're also seeing a decline in non-traumatic workplace injuries and a decline in work-limited disabilities, 
this goes hand in hand with legal states because their hypothesis is if you have access to cannabis, Mm -hmm. maybe your backache is being treated by cannabis instead of opioids. Maybe your joints that are aching, maybe your exhaustion, maybe falling asleep at night and getting some shut eye is Mm -hmm. all because of access to cannabis instead of other ways that you could be um, trying to help yourself. And it sort of gives the lie to that whole thing of like, we can't legalize weed because then everyone's just going to be a stoner on the couch and like not go to work. Actually, no, it makes productive, uh, happy people who have access to a medicine that is, you know, beneficial to them in ways that opioids aren't. 100%. Really well said because, you know, every time somebody steps up with a, "Eh, eh, eh," the government can go, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. That's cool. I like that too. It's it's sort of in keeping with uh, another story that we were talking about that was um, a study that came out in the Harm Reduction Journal, which is a peer-reviewed online medical journal. They studied people who use cannabis to see whether or not they're more sedentary. And it actually turns out that people who smoke weed are more active um, in this study. I mean, you know, it was obviously a segment of like American adults and, you know, lots more data needs to be done. But, you know, it's coming in that, yeah, like, oh, people who have access to legal cannabis are productive workers who are also physically active and living great lives. So there's some data from both those stories. That's fantastic. Mary Jane, I forgot to tell you what happened yesterday. What? Speaking of activities and Mm -hmm. being active while smoking weed, I've been going up to Runyon because I can walk to Runyon. It's about a mile and then I'll walk the Runyon trail. And my goal is if I leave as the sun is setting to get the whole thing done by the time the sun sets and I'm back home Mm -hmm. and it's about an hour and I break a good sweat and I smoke weed on the way there, do the trail, Mm -hmm. boom, come home make some weird salad with a bunch of fridge bowl ingredients and watch Kevin Hart's new special like I did last night. It's very good, by the way. He did it in his home. I highly recommend it. And last night, three kids and a dog Uh got caught on the side of the Runyon Canyon cliff. I don't know how they got there. I don't know how they all got out. But um, cops, sirens, fire ambulance, fire ambulances, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. When a fire truck is shrunk down and yep. deals with injuries, sure. an ambulance. Great. And, uh, it was just a really wild thing because I get such anxiety when I see dogs on Runyon Canyon, like running along the edge and looking over. I see anybody too close cause I'm pretty scared of heights. And last night, three kids and a dog were, we're trapped. trapped and they are fine. Everything is fine. But it was like, it was one of those moments for me where I was like, I'm high, I'm sweating, I'm exercising, and this is like infiltrating. I, I want to help. Like, I just want to slide down or they slide down and I catch them one by one like a goalie making a save. Okay. I, I just wanted to help. And then I was like, there's fucking fire trucks here. Like, I'm not the one who needs to hop the fence and be like, I got it. I right. got it. For right. TikTok views or some shit. I'm glad that everyone's okay. And I also think that it's awesome that you're doing that like nighttime exercise like smoke a joint and go for a sunset hike that is such a good way to take care of yourself and your soul you know it's one of the best things you can do in LA that beautiful evening where the the sky gets that pink and blue that magic hour magic time and I forget that my pores need to work I forget I have pores I mean yes they're very tiny and my skin is very smooth you do have very smooth skin but I need those babies to make sure that they pump yep and to work it out yeah totally it feels so good when your hair is matted down on your forehead because Mm -hmm. of hard work that's a very nice feeling can I say to you about the um, being nervous about dogs being off leash at Runyon it is one of Archie Moo's greatest joys to run free and feel the wind in his hair when we go to Runyon Canyon and I do have to keep an eye out for the occasional pit bull or German Shepherd or Dalmatian or pug or boxer um, all of whom he hates for his own various reasons past lives yep maybe past all lives kinds of things. there are lots of dogs that he loves he loves a Pomeranian he loves all the little guys he's he's really into um, the uh, who are the fucking Rhodesian Ridgebacks for some reason like he really likes the, some certain big dogs majestic but, dog yeah he can be a total fucking asshole to certain dogs so I have to like keep an eye on him and make sure that I leash him up real quick if I see like you know a German Shepherd or a Doberman coming um, but it is one of his greatest joys to run free and have his little ears flap in the wind and have his butt hair you know blow around in the breeze and I see you worry about it and I just don't want you to because he's I happy have to. I know and he's safe and he's okay and I'm with him and I've got my eye on him always it's because dogs are so unpredictable and I know I know I know when you say they just all, they work it out. They, they do. work it out, but damn it, as a as a human being who yes. has a different mind than a dog and is still learning and understanding how they operate, mm-hmm. it is hard for me 
to not be overprotective of the unknown. Well, I think you also, in a funny way, you worry about my dog's manners, which is so funny because you'll see Archie like approach a big dog and he he goes for them sometimes. He's Fuck like, yeah, he does. He's got that little dog syndrome where he's just like, nah, 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 nah. and he's not, <laughs> he's not bitey, but he is like a little snap and snarl kind of, and he's such a little fur bundle. So he looks crazy. He looks like Fizz Gig in the Dark Crystal. He's just like, you know, a bunch of hair and teeth, but he's not like... I don't think he's actually coming across as, a, um, you know, a real problem. Like, I've never seen another dog actually, like, well, there was one Doberman one time. But anyway, like, I think you worry about his his general sort of, like, the way he approaches other dogs. And almost always they will, like, they'll either stand their ground and give him a moment of pause or they'll allow him to just be his own jerky self and they'll move on. But, like, you don't need to worry about Archie I know, but it has less to do with him and more to do with me when you talk ah, about it in that way. It right. has to do with... Um, dog owners and how I'm perceived yeah. as a part of this side of this dog. Right. And when he's a little fucking asshole yeah. and he's like, nyang, 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 it is a reflection on me. And, yeah. and then I'm like having to deal with something I wouldn't have had to deal with had it not happened in the first place. Or a better option is to not feel like I have to deal with any of it and be fucking chill. Right. And I'm working on it. <laughs> You're but working it's on it. Very hard. I will say there's like a whole fucking movie to be written about the dynamics of people and their pets at the dog park. Because like I go to this one um, up in the Mulholland Drive kind of hill, Laurel Canyon area that's beautiful. It's huge. Um, a lot of people who come and bring their dogs, they bring packs because they're dog walkers. So they're like responsible for several dogs. There's some well-known people there. I see Jeff Ross there with his dogs. Um, and it's, you know, it's definitely interesting watching people. Like I watched a dude actually try to network with Jeff Ross yesterday when Jeff Ross was clearly there with headphones in to throw a ball for his dog. Mm -hmm. And he was so nice. But then he was like, I'll catch you on the next lap, buddy. And he just like kept moving on. And I was like, well, yeah, so that's got to be, it's got to be like just so interesting to, and then I, I just avoid everyone. I'm actually really grateful for the current mask situation because you just don't have to have conversations with people at the dog park. But people are really interesting. And there are those people who have the dogs who are like crazy and aggressive and they don't do anything about it. And they just allow them to sort of be. And so I feel you on that. Like you've got to strike that balance of like letting your dog feel itself and not sort of like over correct its behavior, but also be willing to like leash it up right away if it's being, yeah. um, I don't want to say bad, but you know, disagreeable in the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Mooey's a little angel. A little you know, hairy angel. You know what would help me chill out before I go to the dog park with you? More weed? Oh uh, Yeah. <laughs> Especially with the uh, Elevate Bubbler. Uh -huh. Or it, using their rolling trays, even though they're sold out because oh. they're very well made. Yes. Um, oh, man. I'm digging everything Elevate hooked us up with. The dugout, I carry it everywhere I go. The Elevate Bubbler is my at home last night while I was watching Kevin Hart. Can't recommend it enough. Very good special. Yep. Elevate accessories. They're red. I like this mention of Elevate. Yeah, they are great. They sent us the bubbler that we enjoyed so much in Big Bear. We have our weed and grub dugouts, the Colfax dugout. Their whole jam is great. They use all um, natural finishes and biodegradable materials. They're going to last forever because yep. they're made so beautifully. They're crafted perfectly and they're just makes me feel um, elevated when I have one in my back pocket to go to the dog park, honestly, which is yeah. the best place to like hit that dugout. Yo, it really is. Mm -hmm. I Sometimes I can hear the tap of a dugout being cleared uh -huh. like a like a hundred yards away. I feel like <laughs> I have a, a very good sixth sense. You know when you take the lighter and you tap? Ding, ding, ding. Yep. yep. Yeah, I can hear that thing being cleared from a long ways away. Yeah. There's a dugout. Somebody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, check out uh, Elevate at elevateaccessories.com. They're a great company. They are making cool stuff and uh, they support our show. And thank you so much for that. Do you want to get to Buzz of the Week, speaking of people that no, we love? I want to talk about some of the books that we um, asked our listeners to send in because we wanted to celebrate our favorite books in honor of our wonderful guest, Roxanne Gay, who has an incredible book club, and she gives some great recommendations for books that she loves at the end of our interview. So I just wanted to mention a few, and then um, on our Instagram, I think tomorrow we're going to do a whole story where we share everything that everyone sent us because there are a lot of great recommendations for books that I don't know. What is your favorite book? Uh, my, well, I was thinking about it because I have a few that I read like once a year. I return, I always reread Lord of the Flies. I reread Brave New World by Aldous Huxley fairly often. But I was thinking about like one of the books that kind of really fundamentally affected and maybe even altered me a little bit is this beautiful book called The Bone People um, that my friend Meg recommended to me. And I remember she just gave it to me and she was like, just, just here. And she just pressed it into my hand. And it's, 
just heart achingly beautiful and very very sort of um like it, a lot of it's hard to read because it's upsetting but it's so beautiful and so beautifully written and it won um the booker prize in 1984 it's by a new zealand writer named carrie holm and it's called the bone people and i just can't recommend it enough it's gorgeous great wreck it's lush Ooh, mm-hmm. we'll read yeah thank you very much it's beautiful how about you I broke it down into categories. <laughs> Get on my spreadsheet here. Yeah, I know. I love books. Um, childhood book. Yep. Wrinkle in Time. Okay. Hands down. Amazing. Um, college- Did you read all of them? Did you read the whole series? Yes, but Wrinkle in Time is the one. That's the one. Absolutely. Uh, college would be The Onion and Ender's Game. Okay, cool. A uh, practical book would be writing movies for fun and profit. <laughs> okay. Memoir would be Carl Reiner's I Just Remembered. Uh-huh. And Game Changers Through and Through uh-huh. would be The Far Side, oh. which I don't think is, it's kind of a, does it it's fit into game. what we're talking about or not? But it's so fundamental to my marrow and soul yes. that if I don't say the words The Far Side when we're talking about this, absolutely, I'm fucking up. Oh, absolutely. I had, we had tons of uh, The Far Side books in my house growing up. My dad would just like crack it and chortle over his tea. Like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> this is just so great. So good. That's awesome. Well, we asked some friends to weigh in with their recommendations. And like I said, we're going to share them on our IG, but I just really quickly needed to shout out a couple here because I hadn't heard of them and I'm so excited to read them. Our friends over at Bad Manners said that they love Station Eleven, which is a novel by Emily St. John Mandel. And I'll just read the little preview that's available on the wiki. It says, Station Eleven takes place in the Great Lakes region before and after a fictional swine flu pandemic known as the Georgia flu has devastated the world, killing most of the population. It won the Arthur C. Clarke Award in 2015. Whoa. Yeah, I'm so excited to check that out. And then the other one they suggested is called Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler, which is a science fiction novel um, about an apocalypse uh, that's providing commentary on climate change and social inequality. And it's the first in a series of two books. And that sounds amazing. I can't wait to check that out. I moved my TV away from my bed so that I can read at night like I used to do all the fucking time. Right. I miss reading, and it's exciting to make this list again so that I can sleep well and look at a page instead of a screen. So, so, so important. So many studies show that turning off your screens and shutting down for the day and just reading instead is just so much better for your brain and your sleep. And I loved when I was a kid, I devoured books, and I just loved reading under the covers at night with a flashlight. And my parents totally knew what was going on, but they still let me do it. And I, I just, you know, I used to love getting books for Christmas, and I would, like, devour a book that day like I would go hide behind the couch and like read an entire you know whatever it was the the books that I was really into as a teenager were like um I don't even know I can't even remember but I just car children what Amelia Bedelia no when as a teenager I was reading a lot of like Margaret Atwood and you know like getting into some good Canadian literature and you know like yeah before man and the handmaid's tale and that's when I really discovered Lord of the Flies and Aldous Huxley and Orwell and all that kind of stuff and it was just good times Man, bring them back. Yeah. You know, I'm excited to check out all of the recommendations that I don't know and also Roxanne's recommendations. Can I read them off? Because she does plug them at the end. But while we're talking books, before we get to Buzz of the Week, just want to double share. Yeah. She plugs uh, her former students' books, which would be Thin Girls by Diana Clark, A History of Scars, A Memoir by Laura Lee, Of Women and Salt by Gabrielle Garcia. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. I'm so stoked. And her book club is amazing. So... Follow along and read and feed your feed your head. <laughs> <laughs> Should we do that. a Buds of the Week? Let's do it. Do you want to go first or second? I will go first because my Bud of the Week is directly connected to my love of reading. She is one of my most readingest friends uh, who recommended The Bone People to me, Megan McQuillan. I've known Meg for I don't even know how long, but she's just been a dear friend for a really long time now. She's brilliant. She's a fantastic actor. You can actually catch her in um, David Fincher's Mind Hunter. She's on their screens in Law and Order. She's all over the place. She's just so cool, and she reads almost I think more than anyone I know. And um, and I love her so much, and I miss her all the time. So Aww. she's my butt of the week, Megan McQuillan. Great butt of the week. And you can't follow her because she doesn't post. So. Oh, she's so cool. <laughs> she's, she's so, so cool. cool. Yeah, she doesn't post. She has an Instagram, but she doesn't post, so I'm not going to um, share it. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. My butt of the week this week has been a bud before, but 
this is a very special moment that has changed my life. So my butt of the week this week is Cecilia. Chillin' with CC is the Instagram, at Chillin' with CC. I went to Buffalo Wild Wings and got six buffalo wings and a Makers and Water. And I posted about how frustrated I was by the dip cup of ranch because all you can do is dip the tip of the wing. And we've talked about it on here before when we had our perfect wing episode. I want a bathtub shaped dip cup so I can do full wing immersion, dip the middle, which is where you bite. Like the whole thing doesn't make any fucking sense to me. (laughs) And so I was putting on my Instagram, like, we deserve better dips. This is nonsense. I like dip. We just deserve more. And Cecilia DMs me and says, Hey, you want to know a trick? I use corn on the cob trays. You know those corn on the cob rolling trays that you put the stick of butter on and then you can roll the whole piece of corn in butter on that tray? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I know that, what you're talking that's about. That's what she uses for her wings or for any dip situation. Okay. And it's fucking brilliant. That's it changes amazing. The game. Hang on. I pulled up a picture. No, no. I don't. It's, <laughs> oh, my God. It's important. Let the record show that Mike got up from recording, reached for his phone, is taking the time to open it and find the picture there so that I can look at it and I can describe to everyone. That's a corn dish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> We'll put it on our Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it. Uh, it's she, brilliant. It's brilliant, and she rules. And it it kind of helped me as I try to get Buffalo Wild Wings to go for the bathtub shaped tray. Yep. We know that there are options out there for at least the home version of a wing dip for any dip. Yep. And it's the corn tray. So thank you, Cecilia. Thank you for being my butt of the week, and thank you for changing my life. Uh, amazing. <laughs> Well, is it time to get to our VIB? Our very important bud? Yes. Roxanne Gay. Roxanne Gay, who I have to say, we've been watching Roxanne's Instagram story this week, and we have to have her back because her cooking game is off the fucking hook. Like, she's been baking and making all sorts of incredible stuff on her Instagram story, and I was like, we didn't even get to the food. I know. We talked about... so much but we didn't get to the food it really it flew so. by and all i want to do is make her some lemon bars and like hope that she enjoys them yes her pie looked out of control yeah her birthday cake was out of control she made i think it was like a quiche with rendered pork belly yep out of control there was some cupcakes there was a cupcake situation oh, just uh, a tremendous human being amazing so roxanne gay is uh as I'm sure everyone knows, a a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. She's the author of several books, including the New York Times bestselling Bad Feminist, the nationally bestselling Difficult Women, and the New York Times bestselling Hunger. She's also the author of World Wakanda for Marvel. Her writing appears in McSweeney's, Oxford American, American Short Fiction, Virginia Quarterly Review, and many other places. She has several books forthcoming. She's also at work on film and television projects, and she has a new newsletter called The Audacity, plus her book club, The Audacious Book Club. And she, you know, as we said, makes recommendations at the end of our conversation. She's an incredible hang. Just the coolest person. It's really just so exciting to have Roxanne Gay as our very important bud on Weed and Grub. Yeah. You want to get to it? Yep. Without further ado, here is our interview with Roxanne Gay. Roxanne Gay, thank you so much for joining us today on Weed and Grub. How are you? I am good, Mary Jane. How are you? Doing great, thank you. And truly just so thrilled to speak with you. Uh, Thank you. So many things to talk about. First off, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to our podcast, but basically we, we love weed and food and we use those as cornerstones for conversations with incredible people about everything under the sun. So one of the things that we wanted to first ask you is we saw that you have one of Seth Rogen's vases. I do. I do. He gave it to me. He did? He did. It's, I, I, I want to know um, about the vase and also about whether or not you've had the opportunity to enjoy any of his other products that he's <laughs> recently come out with. <laughs> not yet. It's funny. I Every time I went online to buy some, I um, get in that ridiculous queue and I never make it to the front of the line because I'm 46. I'm sorry. I'm not going to jump up and down when I can go to MedMen right down the street. And so when I finally did make it in the queue, I was out of town and 
like you can't i was gonna have my assistant wait for the delivery but you can only they'll only deliver to you so i haven't tried his wares yet and i'm sure i could like dm him like Yo, do you think you could hook me up but it's not that deep i actually don't really partake that much so kind of boring not at all i mean he's yeah he's he's come out with, with the the three the three strains. yeah and the can't uh, the reason I, the real reason i want to order some is that the container i mean i love a good packaging it's really cute yeah we honestly we were looking at your twitter and you have a, a snapshot of your tv and kind of the like surrounding artwork and all mm-hmm. the different like the little coons piece and the little yoyoi kusama piece and i think the seth rogan uh houseplant tins have a place maybe on your shelf they might especially um i'm in new york right now um my wife and i are by coastal and um i have plenty of like there's no blank space in this house but i have some blank space in la and i would love to um you know, put some decorative tins somewhere as a great conversation piece when what is that? Well, Seth Rogen invented some marijuana or whatever, <laughs> curated some marijuana. And those are the containers. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you think it is. <laughs> it was such a great I mean, I think the just the picture of the vase with yes, it is. And then the the sort of like the pylon of everyone going, what do you mean? And you were just silent throughout. Like, oh, oh, yeah, because do that. <laughs> I tend to um, just mute my tweets almost immediately after I put them into the universe. Because it, when I first joined Twitter, I had like 200 followers. And so I, I was able to keep up with it. And now I, I have significantly more and a lot of people don't really engage from a genuine place and especially since i got married and i married someone who is not super online i have found that there's really nothing to be gained from silly engagement and so like why am i going to sit there you know answering all kinds of weird questions when either you get the reference or you don't not everything is for everybody it's okay if so. you know, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> one of those things. I'm so, I mean, if you know, you know, because there's so much that happens online and I have no idea what people are talking about and I have to go down a rabbit hole and figure it all out. And that's OK. Like, if you really want to know, do the work. And I do. I think much of much have been much has been made of your Twitter in addition to all of your work, your writing career, everything that you your your work as an author and editor and cultural voice. But your Twitter is such a, a fascinating platform for so many people, not least because of uh, your very, may I say, entertaining um, list of nemeses, which <laughs> <laughs> I was d- diving into a little bit because I also was just reading about your love for comics and mm-hmm. your work as a writer on World of Wakanda. And I wondered if that sort of the idea of the nemesis comes at all from your love of mythology. And I wondered if there was a tie in in there at all. Um, No, I think that people have put a lot more intensity on the nemesis thing than is actually (laughs) there. Mm -hmm. Uh, If if I had known when I started joking about nemesis online that people would lose their goddamn minds over it. And yeah, if I had known, I would absolutely not have started it started it you know like it was just like guys what uh you know i really do have nemeses that part is real it's all real honestly but you know people take it a lot more intensely in that i'm actually a nice person and i am non-violent and so you know when people start to get really carried away like oh would you be would you be excited if your nemesis like went up in flames and the answer is absolutely not you fucking serial killer what is your problem (laughs) (laughs) no that would not be okay because you know my nemeses are worthy adversaries they're not like harvey weinstein who deserves to you know like rotten hell or something and so while i have lots and lots of strong feelings about them I am certainly not going to sit around like and if I like think negative thoughts about them, it's more like and and I've written this like it would be great if they were out on a really sunny day without sunglasses. Like that's Mm -hmm. the level. And yeah, and I think that's appropriate and humorous and and that that's kind of it. And so um, it's a little more intense online than I ever intended it to be. But that's okay. I mean, that's what happens. Like, you don't have control over the things that you say once you say them. So you just have to, I think, just know that going in. Would a pimple 
on the day that you wake up and you're on camera be a be be along the same lines as sunglasses for you or is that oh yeah yeah, for sure like absolutely like i mean glory that would be glory (laughs) like look at that (laughs) that's what you get for being evil (laughs) yeah Ooh, ingrown toenail yes And, and i mean like moderately evil not criminal evil Um, which is a whole different category. You know, like, that's the thing. None of this is about people who are criminal or sexual predators or things like that. It, it, you know, like that, no. These are rivals, mostly. Mm -hmm. I think that competition is super healthy and having, but there's, unless you are a very competitive person, I don't think a lot of people understand that competitive doesn't mean mean. It doesn't mean like you want to destroy somebody else. It just means it's like good fuel for you to excel in places that you care about. For sure. It, it, it you know, I, I too believe that competition is healthy. I am a very competitive person. And so when I say like, I'm going to destroy my nemesis, I don't mean like destroy them such that you know, something like real would harm them. It's more, I'm going to do something so great that they're going to be left behind in their mediocrity. And like, to me, that's destroying someone. And I'm very excited about the prospect of that at all times. Um, But it's about me stepping up my game and it makes me work harder and try and write better and you know, we all require different kinds of motivation. And for me, I find that to be incredibly helpful. Did you grow up in Nebraska? I know you were born in Nebraska. I did. I did. Mm -hmm. In Omaha, right? Yes. And then I know you've traveled and lived in so many places and had so many different groups of friends and lives. Do you find that now at this stage of your life that people from the past are reaching out to you to try <laughs> to connect with you? Is that like a something that's still happening to you? Or you, have you reached a level where you're just dealing with present friends and people in your life now? Oh, no, I, I hear from people from K through 12, actually K through 16, all the time. And it's interesting because I moved around a lot as a child. So my dad's company that he worked for, for I think 30 years was headquartered in Omaha. It was a heavy construction company. And so we would leave and come back, leave and come back. And a lot of the kids I grew up with have actually reached out. And when I've done events in Nebraska, they have come to my events. And if they have moved elsewhere, they have come to my events in other cities. And it's really interesting because I was incredibly unpopular growing up. And my memories of our interactions have been quite different from their memories. (laughs) And so I always tend to suspect that the truth is somewhere in the middle of the two recollections and it's interesting and eye-opening like oh now you want to reach out okay well hi and goodbye (laughs) (laughs) i love it because you can do the same with one hand you can give Uh them one of these and then you can give them one of these absolutely (laughs) absolutely you know i as i like to say i have enough friends I'm I'm not looking for any more. I mean, if I do make new friends, that would be lovely. And, you know, I would, yeah, it would be, I mean, who doesn't want new friends? But uh, it's not something that I'm like actively looking for. And uh, so, I mean, and there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, I've always had, uh, it's always been challenging for me to mm-hmm. um, make friends. And so it it's just like, The friends I have are incredibly wonderful. I've had them in my life for so many years. And unfortunately, when I have tried to make new friends, inevitably, that person actually doesn't really want to be my friend. They actually just want something. And I wish you would just ask up front, like, for what you want. It's so much easier. You don't have to, like, pretend to like me. That's a lot of work. Just be like, I need a blurb. Okay, let's do it. Or not. But I I don't know why people would think that this elaborate ruse of friendship is like what's going to get them to the promised land of can you hook me up with your agent or whatever it is I want. Are you you have, were you ever scared to ask for what you want with Uh-oh. people? Always. I mean, okay. 
I'm still scared. I ne- I rarely um, ask for what I want. I'm terrible at it. But fortunately, I am now at the stage of my career where other people ask for what I want. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I pay them 5 to 15% <laughs> to make it happen. It's great. And I, I think that, like, yeah, that elaborate ruse of someone sort of trying to slide into your DMs and then have a conversation with you about you and your life versus just, you know, directly emailing you and saying, hi, here, I, I have a question for you, to hear directly from you that you prefer that um, way of communicating, hopefully, will give everyone the idea that you you can just be straight up and that's so much easier for everyone involved especially now in 2021 like there's no space for um bullshit i feel like yeah i mean you know life is short the thing is i'm pretty chill and i have you know i'm i'm pretty well known for like being happy to to connect people who need to be connected or to bring attention to great books. And so you actually, I mean, I'm not doing it because people are my friends, even though I'll do it for my actual friends. I'm I'm doing it because I love books. And uh, there are so many wonderful books in the world that do not get nearly enough attention. Quite frankly, it's the least that anyone can do is be like, hey, here are some great books that I'm reading right now or whatever. And so it's so sad that people think that they have to do this elaborate ruse. Um, and it's a little cynical, like, that's actually not it. Write a good book. That's kind of all you really have to do. And if I somehow become aware of it, or if you email me and say, hey, I think you should know about my book. Like, let's just go from there and see what happens. It's cool. You started a a book club just this year. I did. The Audacious Audacious Book Club. And uh, it's going gangbusters. I feel like everyone wants to read what you're reading. How are you having fun doing it? Is it a great time? It is a great time. I um, actually never really joined book clubs for a lot of reasons. I am not Mm -hmm. much of a joiner. And my schedule, especially over the past seven years, has not been conducive to things like that. But I am having a lot of fun with this book club and my assistant, Caitlin Adams, who, you know, assistant is not the right word, but it is what we have for now, uh, helps me manage the club. And I'm so grateful for that. And so do my um, editors for my newsletter, Brooke Obie and Meg Pillow. And I think between the four of us, we have managed to host some really great conversations over the past uh, four months. And I'm really excited about the rest of the year. And in June, I have a big announcement about the book club because I am partnering with a company who is actually going to handle a lot of the infrastructure of the club for me. And they're going to print special editions of the books I've chosen and things like that. So I'm really excited uh, for the book club to expand in this way. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'm really, really thrilled um, because it was just an idea that I thought up when I when uh, Substack approached me to do the newsletter. I thought, well, what could I use this for um, beyond just a place for me to air my thoughts out? And I thought a book club would be great because we're all stuck in our houses indefinitely and it so far has been wonderful. There, like people, readers are awesome, and when they actually read, they're so engaged and they have such interesting questions, and so it's been a great experience. And I, um, I'm excited to see how the club grows. I'm so excited about it because I, honestly, my the only book club I ever belonged to was when I lived in New York, and um, it wasn't very much fun because none of us liked each other, and <laughs> we <laughs> would never like one person would choose a book that nobody else ever wanted to read. And so Mm -hmm. half the book club would show up having read half of it begrudgingly. And then everyone would just get really drunk. And I think the last meeting we had, I fell down the stairs on my way out because I'd had so much wine to escape Mm -hmm. the The actual book club. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I don't think you can ever go wrong with wine. Um, That's actually quite awesome. (laughs) (laughs) On the wine tangent, big fat juicy red or crisp cold white oh i red i um don't really enjoy white wine my wife does but nah i enjoy a robust red (laughs) and i like a little champagne like but really good champagne it's got to be old and it's got to be expensive (laughs) for mary jane's birthday i just tried my first ever expensive champagne Mm -hmm. i get it Right like now, I now I get it. Holy cow! The first time I had um, fancy champagne was actually surprisingly late in life. But I was on a an Emirates flight and from 
uh, Melbourne, Australia. To, I'm sorry, from Auckland, New Zealand to Melbourne, Australia, which is actually a five hour flight, five and a half hours. And so I was on Emirates and I upgraded for like $700 to their ridiculous fa- fancy first class. Never seen anything like it. There was a shower up there. <laughs> and when you get, I mean, and people fucking shower during the flight. <laughs> And I'm just like, y'all just showered on a plane. Wow. (laughs) Look at us. Look at us in the future. Uh, um, The Flintstones, I mean, the Jetsons dreams did come true. And (laughs) so when you board the plane and you sit down, they give you some almonds and other like little charcuterie and a glass of either Dom Perignon or Krug. And so that was the first time I had expensive champagne. And I was, when I tasted it, I was like, I don't, (laughs) Hank, I'm sorry, I asked for champagne. (laughs) (laughs) because i just i didn't even know what the fuck i was drinking because up until then it had been like mostly like you know andre and uh it was life-changing and and now it has ruined me and (laughs) that's fine i don't mind being ruined i mean the good stuff is like really good yeah there's a great have you ever seen the orson wells commercial where he's trying to do an ad for french champagne and he's like so in his cups like he can't even stand up and he, the extras are just standing there like trying to hold their pose as he's going like oh French champagne it's uh, we'll have to share a link I will have yeah please do <laughs> because that sounds beyond great amusing <laughs> um this this was kind of an important question how tiny an elephant are we talking about that oh, you would like man. to own that's how a good bit, question how small I would say about as big as a baby as a little piglet a tiny one yeah like a tiny baby elephant but if a real baby elephant happened upon my front porch i would love it and i would i would make it work i would i would just make my backyard into a, a an elephant heaven <laughs> with whatever my little baby elephant wanted to eat it would be fine for at least six months. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, we're, we're talking about you, your stated desire to have a baby elephant that is in your Twitter bio. Yes. What is it that you love about? Is it their knees? Is it their little hairy little it's noses? It's all of them. It's their little noses and that little patch of hair when they're first born that goes away yeah. somehow. And the way they sort of awkwardly stumble and... Um, try to, uh, you know, walk and when they're trying to use their little trunks. And I just love the idea of a tiny version of this thing that ends up growing up to be big and majestic. I wanted to ask you on the on the grub tip, because we love talking so much about uh, all of the wonderful things in our food world. Did you grow up eating your family, your parents uh, immigrated from Haiti? Mm hmm. And but you grew up in Nebraska. So what was dinner like at home? Did you have a like a regular kind of dinner that you ate, or was it all different? Yeah, kind of I mean, dinner was confused. <laughs> My mom uh, would once in a while, not once in a while. I, I would say every couple of weeks she would make Haitian food, but it tends to be um, not laborious per se. But there tend to be a lot of steps and sometimes ingredients that you have to actually order from a you know. And this was pre-internet mostly, so it's not like you could just go on Amazon or like some other like online emporium and get all the ingredients you need. So she would generally have to wait till like her sister would come visit her and bring like the secret stash or my grandma. And so um, she made a lot of American foods. My mom to this day does not have a passion for cooking. So we ate well and she made everything from scratch all the time. Like I, I've never had a TV dinner things like that. So it was just a, a an eclectic mix of what she thought was American food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was interesting. <laughs> were, were you at the dinner table together every single mm-hmm. night eating that food? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah to this day. Um, uh, my parents are now sort of in transition going back and forth between my house and my brother's house. And my my wife was like, you guys eat together every day? And talk to each other. And I'm like, yeah, I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> Portrait of a family that likes each other. Uh, well, <laughs> like is no, I'm just kidding. We do like each other, and um, we do. E- even growing up, my parents um, would eat with us. We would eat with our parents, and they would ask us about our little dumb day. And 
I mean, bless their hearts. Cause like looking back, I'm like, how did they get through that boring ass shit? I'm like, I was at recess and, and then Erica Schnell. And like what? Stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, sometimes you got to look at parents and be like, how did you get through that? Cause like sometimes when my nieces call and they just sort of like start rambling, I love them to death and I'll listen to them ramble forever. But I'm just like, how do their parents do this every single day? Wow. Did being a teacher kind of affirm those feelings or did they change those feelings for you as you continued to teach? Well, I teach college students. So in many ways, it's, it's, I mean, teaching is teaching, but because they are 18 and older or 17 and older, give or take, there's a reasonable amount of independence and there's so much they don't know, but you're not dealing with children who are still like figuring out how to be human in addition to whatever it is that you're trying to teach them. So I think in a lot of ways, the job is easier. Uh, but it certainly did. It 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 has taught me that I am not equipped to teach children, children in any way, mm-hmm. shape or form. I don't have the patience for it. I'm a good teacher, but I, I don't have a lot of patience. And so when I see my friends who are teachers of K through 12, or whatever grade in there, the, their patience that they have for their kids and the love like these people are anointed triple their pay and shut the fuck up because <laughs> yeah what they put and i think in certain places where people value education i think that we should see salaries going up very soon because i think a lot of parents are like oh yes you guys deserve every penny because take my children take them right now <laughs> School is 24 hours a day. <laughs> yes. All year. All year. All year. S- what is summer anyway? <laughs> Every child has to go to boarding school. Mm. All, all of you off to boarding school. You went to boarding school, right? I did. I did. Did you like it? Mm. I, I didn't love it, but it wasn't because it was boarding. I wouldn't have loved it no matter what, just because I was fucked up at that age. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was interesting. It was an adventure. And... It was certainly the most rigorous part of my entire education. It was harder than graduate school. So it's it was a good foundation for everything I would end up doing afterward. Both my parents went to boarding school and I begged and pleaded, but they weren't able to send me. So mm-hmm. I just I'm always wondering, like, what what would life have been like if I'd had that? Oh, a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> a lot harder. Right? <laughs> I don't know about harder. I mean, I think that a lot of schools are rigorous. I think it, well, emotionally, I think it tends to be hard. Like I, I basically left home. In fact, my dad was talking about this the other day. He's like, you know, you kind of moved out at 13. And I was like, yeah, I did. I don't know you people. No, I do know them very well. Um, but, you know, when I when I look back on it, I just think 13. I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I could send my child into the world at 13. I mean, and there's plenty of supervision and so on. But still. It's not the same as under your parents' roof. And to imagine that there are people that send their children to, uh, you know, like K through eight boarding schools over in England, I just cannot even begin to figure out how that works. But, you know, look what it did to Charles. Yeah, my my dad grew up uh, at boarding school in York during the Second World War, and he was like that kind of Jesus Christ how old is your father he passed uh, oh I'm sorry no no it's okay he he, but he lived a long life he was 85 when he passed but he was born in 1931 so he yeah lived through that era of the world and definitely passed a lot of those messages and and uh, lessons on to his kids yeah I just it's so interesting that you say that I just today read an essay from a great writer named Jane Ratcliffe about her parents who lived through World War II she's British and uh, seeing the ways in which that experience affected them. And it's just so interesting. You know, we always talk about history being this far away thing, but it's not. Like people who survived World War II are living among us and just walking around a little older, but still like history is right here. It's always interesting when I when something like this reminds me of that. It's a big mind fuck for me too, because... The world is so different. I am on nine screens at once and somehow feeling like I'm also productive, even though who the hell knows. Mm -hmm. And the world is like, the world is so different, but at the core, the same people in charge, the same things, like nothing has changed, even though everything has changed. Yeah, I think 
it's really easy to believe that if, for example, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris get, are elected, that the world will change. But especially for those of us who had jobs or access to unemployment insurance over the past year, um, even after the, you know, before the election, like, we know that the world was fucked up. But for a lot of people, our lives really didn't change in any material way. And it's surreal in some ways. Like, yeah, you know, life goes on. Whatever. If you if you choose to not be politically engaged and politically aware, you know, you can just proceed. My brother lives in Houston, Texas, and he was like, what pandemic? And then he got COVID. So <laughs> he's fine. But, okay. you know, okay. it's interesting to see the way in which and, and he masked. He's believes in science and all that. Um, but it was interesting to just hear him when he would be like, so what are you guys doing? And we're like, we're doing what we did last time we spoke, (laughs) which is watching TV. There's nothing to do. What part of lockdown do you not understand? (laughs) And he's like, oh, well, I just, I don't know. The restaurants are open here. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, "Oh, oh my God. Yeah. It's just, you know, for a lot of people, life is just normal. Ish. Yeah. On the TV tip mm-hmm. i'll i'll say it for you mary jane if you don't mind oh yes is that okay sure law and order svu all the time amen all day I, and, and now i'm into it and <laughs> i i don't even know what what exists besides top chef and law and order svu I'm i actually not really i should sure. sh- from all if you don't mind I, i'd love to show you the uh, christmas gift that mike gave me hang on yeah dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you can see that but he had me made into marishka Yes. And this is my dog as Stabler. Mm-hmm. And then my cat is Richard Belzer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my called, gosh. Um, fur, special fur fam unit. That's <laughs> incredible. Mershka would love that. She would die <laughs> laughing if she saw that. That's hilarious. Um, yeah. SVU is, you know, and I've, I've thanked SVU in my acknowledgments for at least a couple of my books because it's always on. Especially yes. on like USA and um, I don't know, and it's in every city it's different, but it's uh, Channel Thirty here, and it, you know like every Saturday it's just as for you all day, and I just love that, even though the subject matter of the show is quite horrific, and especially now, as we have a reckoning that has been a long time coming with police violence, I am wary of watching shows that glorify the police um, because I think that glorification happens to the detriment of black and brown people. But SVU has a a special place in my heart. Like there's a rhythm to it. And you know that in general, any tension will be resolved in the current episode or the one that follows. And that's really appealing in a world where there isn't a lot of closure and when there's a lot that's sort of confusing and unknown. SVU will get the job done. It does. It does. It's. I find it so comforting and sort of like white noise. And mm-hmm. I, I lived in New York for 13 years and I still miss the sounds of the city so I can fall asleep to SVU and kind of pretend that I'm still in my in my house in, you know, New York. But mm-hmm. um, I think a big part of it, too, is just like that. Yeah, the moral center that uh, Mariska Hargitay mm-hmm. provides is just like, you know, it's going to be OK. You do. And she's just got such a yeah, like a moral clarity that's appealing. And what's interesting is I still watch the show, the new episodes, and it's been really interesting to see how the show is trying to adapt with the changing norms of our world. And now they're talking more about police brutality and coming up with better ways of policing and things like that and actively talking about it on the show. And And I still think that the show is problematic in the context of police which should be abolished but you know for what it is at least they acknowledge that sometimes the police aren't a force for good and that sometimes police officers abuse their power I mean I would say more than sometimes but for a tv show like this that is very much in the bag of the police to acknowledge these things I think is is interesting and good yeah, I thought it was really interesting when they tried to sort of do the rip from the headlines with the um, Amy Cooper uh, bird watching mm-hmm. 
uh, yes. storyline. <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was great. They they did it the SVU way. They did. It's so every time they they <laughs> rip something from the headlines. You, you, you know, you're watching and you're like, OK, I think I know where this is going. And then there's that like 20 minutes in twist and then that 40 minutes in twist and then that resolution. <laughs> and, and it's like, huh, you really double twisted that that news story. OK. Ripped from a whole bunch of headlines. <laughs> yes. And they do sometimes do make a little headline potpourri. Just three different little stories. Why not? We can make it work. Um, I'd like to talk about all of your writing. I mean, fiction, nonfiction, screenplays tweets scrabble um i don't know if you have any inspirational wood carvings on your walls that say things like hang in there live laugh love oh god Uh, no i do not (laughs) (laughs) no motivational placards not that there's anything wrong with that but that's that's not my ministry this is like a three-parter but I'll do the best I can. Mm-hmm. Is a is a part of it for you getting it out out of yourself in a way that feels right? Is it about mastering a form and figuring out what form fits what you're thinking and feeling? Um, because I you've you've said in so many interviews that your process is a lot of thinking, a mm-hmm. lot of thinking. And so I'm just I'm wondering like once once you're thinking if it's like I just want to master fiction to the best of my ability or it's like no i just have something to say and fiction is where it fits so let's let's figure out how to say it it's more the second the latter uh i love working across genre for a lot of reasons but early in my career you know editors would try to pigeonhole my work and say oh you're a black writer and reality is i am a black writer i'm a woman etc etc but i'm also just a writer and i do not separate my identity from my work, but my identity is not the only aspect about my work. You know, I just want to tell interesting stories. And so I started to work across genres so that from one project to the next, you never quite know what I'm going to do. And I think that being nimble in that way just has afforded me the ability to feel like I am writing on my own terms. And I've been very, you know, it's, it's a privilege to be able to do that. And to have your audience follow you and welcome it, even when, you know, not everything's going to be a hit. And so when I'm trying to decide, sometimes it's because someone approaches me and says, hey, do you want to do this thing in this specific genre? But other times it's I have this idea and then I try to think what is the most effective way and the most interesting way for me to communicate this idea and then it'll be like a short story or a novel or an essay or whatever. Have you found an editor who uh, has really shaped your work or have you collaborated with different editors and for different projects? How, how have you yes. worked as, a, as an editor yourself and then becoming a writer and knowing that you need that other person to p- partner with? How, how has that worked for you? I have several different editors and they've all been wonderful. I must say, I've been, again, I've been lucky. Um, Bad Feminist was edited by a woman named Maya Zeev, who now heads up um, the Dutton imprint and at uh, Penguin Random House. So we're still friends. And she taught me so much about thinking about the whole of a book and and how to make every essay in a collection speak to a singular purpose while standing on their own. And a lot of those essays in that book were edited by uh, Julie Grecius or Isaac Fitzgerald, who were uh, my editors at The Rumpus, and definitely still friends with both of them. And I learned just so much about (laughs) bringing some discipline to my unfiltered thoughts, (laughs) which, (laughs) you know, especially when I was first starting out with nonfiction was incredibly important. And I love that they, I've always had editors who are willing to just tell me, make this change. It's for the best. And uh, I actually rarely say no to edits. I think I've turned down like three edits in the whole of my career. uh, Because editors are there to make the work better. And, you know, like my fiction editor for book length projects is a woman named Amy Hunley at Grove Atlantic, where I do my fiction. She also is willing to tell me, okay, that's too indulgent. That's too violent. That's too much. Maybe you should add more here. Uh, I trust her judgment, and she has really great taste. And so it get and, it, and then um, 
My current uh, nonfiction editor is a woman named Emily Griffin, who, again, has just great taste and a great sense of when too much is too much. And she's just really good at helping to bring more shape to a, a project. Like I had recently sent her the first chapter of my next book, which ideally is going to come out in November. And um, she was just like, yeah, OK, this is great, but it's three pages don't belong in there. You can put them somewhere else, but they don't belong in the first chapter. And I just love that insight. And it sounds simple, but it's actually not. And, you know, she's, you know, there's a real skill behind sort of identifying what works and what doesn't. And so, yeah, I've had some really good editors and I continue to work with really good editors. Do you have someone who holds you accountable or do you do that all for yourself? I feel like you're probably pretty good with deadlines. Uh, I'm horrible with deadlines. I'm, it's it's the one thing I'm not proud of about my yeah I'm or I'm, I used to be very good with deadlines and then like many writers you start to say yes to everything because you worry that it's going to be the last opportunity you ever get and I, I, there's only one of me so yeah I, it's just like yes I, even when I say no people come back and say you know, they try to make the offer more enticing. And it's like, oh, I'm actually not playing hard to get. I genuinely will kill myself if I have to do this. And uh, then I say yes anyway. So Ugh. deadlines, it's bad. It's really bad right now. And I hope after I get this sort of next slate of work off my plate by 2023, and I wish that was a joke, but it's not. Um, from that point forward, I hope I can just start saying no more. And just get back onto a timely thing. But there are plenty of people to hold me accountable. And, and I, I, I think I hold myself accountable first and foremost, because that's just the way I am. When, oh yeah, deep breath, Mary Jane. What, like the spread thin part, we, mm. we were just talking about how we kind of feel like a sandwich under a rolling pin <laughs> at times right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, like it's a there's a lot of juicy, delicious layers, but it is all the old just, panini effect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, and so how do you fill your pitcher back up with all of these deadlines and all of this mm-hmm. writing? How do you what like how do you make the time, and what do you do with that time that makes you feel fulfilled? I don't have an answer because I don't know. I just right now it's just I'm just constantly working. And just constantly trying to get stuff out and trying to make it good um, because I, I just don't want bad work in the world. Not everything I put out in the world is perfect, but I would like to believe everything I put out in the world is well considered and and good. And some of it is great. And, you know, I, I'm always aiming for great. I'm always aiming for excellent. And that's kind of what keeps me going is just wanting to get better, wanting to get smarter, wanting to be, to give more depth to the work. And that, I find that motivational. I'm, I guess I'm a bit of a masochist in that regard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you like nine rolling pins. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I've also, any... oh, Oops, sorry. No, go ahead. I've also started taking vacations while well, pre-COVID. I took my first vacation in the summer of 2019. Yes, in the summer of 2019. And and then that winter, we also took another vacation. And on, on both vacations, I did not open my laptop. And that was so freeing. And when I got back, I was actually, I put an away message on my email. And when I got back, I was able to take a deep breath and focus for a little while because I had taken some time off. And so I'm trying to just remember, like, at least once a year, I need to take a couple weeks off and just relax. How do you feel when you finish a book or a, or anything? Do you feel empty or do you take a moment to enjoy it or is it on to the next thing? Like, how it's do you feel? It's on to the next thing. Yeah. There's yeah. no ce- celebratory glass of no. champagne after, no? <laughs> it's bad. I, and I'm actually trying to, to pull myself out of that cycle because it just doesn't seem healthy to not celebrate finishing some of these major projects. Like, oh, I finished the movie or whatever, like man, sit down and enjoy it for a second. Like the other day I sold a TV show and I didn't even like, I was just like, okay, I looked at my, I literally looked at my calendar and was like, okay, what's next? And that's not healthy. And so I I am trying to remind myself to enjoy 
the successes and the the sort of victories because they don't happen every day by any stretch of the imagination. And when I finish something, I try to like sit with that for at least an hour or two <laughs> um, because, you know, it sort of sucks some of the joy out. Many years ago, there's this really great writer. He lives in Atlanta. His name is Blake Butler. And I used to write with him on a website he uh, co-founded called HTML Giant, which is where um, a lot of sort of edgy alternative writers posted and then there was me um and he wrote this thing about submitting your work to magazines and one of the things he said was the enjoyment from an acceptance of a you know a story essay poem whatever becomes less and less the more you get and he said you know try to hold that off for as long as possible and I've never forgotten that because at the time I thought oh man that'll never be me (laughs) <laughs> and then, <laughs> sure enough, he was exactly right. And and so I am I just try to be as mindful as I can. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I do not. Wow. Well, we're so grateful to talk to you and glad for your time. Thank you so much. So excited to read your book that's coming out in November. Thank you. It's called and How to Be Heard. H-E-A-R-D. Mm-hmm. I was just concerned. It's not a herd immunity. Um. Like how to be heard like H-E-R-D. <laughs> I, that's a badass book. It's like, man, this is how how to be a farm animal. <laughs> Let's get that immunity going. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Would you like to plug everything, anything? What are you most excited about? Like, what are you excited about? What would you like to plug? Yeah, I would love to plug a few things. So um, my former students are starting to um, publish books, uh, especially my former thesis students from when I was teaching at Purdue. And so I'm going to just name three books that are incredible that deserve your time and attention. Uh, One is called Thin Girls by Diana Clark. And it is about two twin sisters uh, and their complicated relationship, not only with each other, but with food. And then uh, Laura Lee wrote this gorgeous essay collection called A History of Scars. And it was recently out. And for health reasons, she was unable to promote the book. And so it needs all the love it can get because not only was she unable to promote the book, but there is no touring. And there, you know, there's it's a hard time to launch a book. And then um, this student who her book is doing very well, but still you can read it. Her name is Gabriela Garcia. And the book is called uh, Of Women in Salt. And it is a novel about three generations of Cuban women uh, between Cuba and the United States and their lives and sort of how the past and the present are intertwined. And these are just lovely, lovely books. And in the meantime, people can read your newsletter and join your book club (laughs) and listen to your podcast. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I have a couple little things happening here and there. Yeah. You have an advice column in the New York Times. I do. (laughs) We'll we'll put links to everything in the show notes. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be the longest show notes we've ever had. That's kind of exciting. It's just you're going to have to three three swipes to see it all. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time, Roxanne. It's been wonderful to hang out with you. And um, I can't wait to check out all the books and your recommendations. And please come back anytime. We'd love to have you. I will. Anytime you will. Thank you all so much for listening. Have a really lovely day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.